Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? Are you sure? Really sure? All right, good to see you in church this morning. We're thrilled that you are in the house. Let's give it up for all these wonderful parents and kids one more time. It's always a privilege to get to share this very special day with families who are dedicating their kids. And I know over the last few weeks, we've had a lot of conversations just getting families ready for this day. And we are so grateful. It's really a privilege to get to share this very special moment with all of you. If you're new to the bridge, my name is Zach, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And I have the privilege of getting to share with you this morning. So if you got your Bible, would you meet me in Ephesians chapter 3? Ephesians 3. And I'm thrilled to share this message because I felt like God put this in my heart about 10 days ago. And that sounds very precise, but it is because I know how the Lord kind of spoke to me about this message, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. I want to bring you a message this morning called, What's the Point? What's the Point? That seems like kind of a funny title for a message, but you'll understand why in just a few moments, why it's called that. But I heard a great story not too long ago, and I'm certain that it's probably not true, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway this morning. And it goes like this. There was a family that lived in a really small country town, in a real rural area. And they went to a very small country church. And they would get there, and every week a few people would gather. And there weren't a whole lot of people in this church. And so therefore, because there wasn't a lot of help, they didn't have a kid's ministry in the church. They just had a nursery for babies. So the babies could have a place to go during service. But if you were a child in the service, you had to sit in the adult service with mom and dad. And there was a family that had a five-year-old son in that small town, and they would bring their little boy to church every single Sunday. And this little boy hated coming to church. And the reason he hated it was because every week he had to sit through one hour of preaching from an older pastor in the church who was bringing a message to people like his parents, but it was totally irrelevant to him. He hated coming to church. He hated sitting through it. And just about every single Sunday, he would come to church and 15 minutes into the message, like clockwork, he would become disinterested, totally bored, and he would begin to doze off and go to sleep. And his father, out of the corner of his eye, would look over, tap him on his shoulder and say, son, wake up. This is your opportunity, wives, to do that to your husbands right now. You can just tap him on the shoulder real quick, say, wake up. We're not going to be too long today, don't worry. But every week, the boy would get that tap on the shoulder saying, son, wake up, and he would perk up and do his best to come to attention and listen to what that pastor had to say. But every week for him, it was like torture. It was like pulling teeth. He thought that going to church every Sunday was going to be the death of him. And on one such Sunday, the family got finished with church. The boy made it through an entire hour of the pastor's preaching, and they walked outside, and as soon as they exited the church building, he noticed that it was very, very windy outside. And the church had a big flagpole right out in front of their church building. And the wind had caught that American flag and thrown it up into the air. And for the first time, the boy stopped and he took note of just how big that American flag was. And he thought, wow, what a huge flag. And as they walked to the car, the little boy looked at his father and he said, Daddy, I had never realized just how big that flag was. That's the biggest American flag I've ever seen. And he said, Dad, why do we have such a big flag right there in front of our church building? And the father said, well, son, that flag is actually a memorial, and it is there to remember those who died in service. And the little boy said, yeah, that makes sense, but I just have one question, Dad. Did those people die in the 930 or the 1130 service? (laughs) What's the point? Why is it there? I tell you that this morning because... It occurs to me that there are times for all of us in our lives, especially when it comes to walking with God and the things of faith, where we can begin to go through the motions and stop and never ask the question, why do we do this? What's the point? What's the purpose behind what we're doing? And I had an experience like this not too long ago. It wasn't a bad experience or a negative experience, but instead, I found myself going through a bit of a routine. And it was as if the Lord was speaking to me and reminding me this question, What's the point? What's the purpose in doing this? It actually happened 10 days ago right here in this room. On Thursday afternoons at 1 o'clock, we have staff prayer, and all of our School of Ministry students will come and join us, our staff, and we'll pray right here in the auditorium. And our main focus is to pray for this day. We pray for our services, the function of all of our services. We pray for our teams and what they do. In fact, we pray for you, all who are going to be coming to church on Sunday. Maybe this is your very first time. We prayed for you, actually, that you would be here in the house if somebody invited you to be in church today. We take time to pray for Sundays. But in the midst of doing this, I found myself kind of going through a routine. 
Because as I walked up and down the aisles of this room, up and down the stairs in the back, I would sometimes stand and walk, I would sometimes sit down, I would sometimes kneel and pray, and I found myself praying for the same things that I always did. And as I walked around, for some reason it just hit me, this is what I always do. And I had this feeling of, has this lost value to me? Is it still important to me when I pray for Sundays, when I pray for our church, and when I pray for people? And it was like the Holy Spirit just whispered to me and said, what's the point? What's the purpose? Why do you do this? And a few minutes later, when we concluded our prayer time, we'll always have one of our pastors kind of take the lead with our staff and students, and we'll just recap a couple of thoughts, you know, if the Lord brings anything to mind, and then together we'll pray for Sunday. And I asked our team, I said, what's the point? Why do we do this? Why do we gather? What's the purpose and the point of Sundays? It would be terrible if we got to a place where we simply went through the motions and allowed church to become a routine and lost sight of why we do it. I wanna tell you this morning, church, if you've ever found yourself in a place in your walk with God where you stop and say, what's the point and what's the purpose? It might not be a bad question. In fact, it might get you back on track and lead you into a closer relationship with God. And that's what I wanna focus in on this morning, and I wanna look at Ephesians chapter three. Now, a couple things you need to know from Ephesians three is that Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and you could almost take the six chapters in the book of Ephesians and split it in half into two books. Because what we see is that in the first half of Ephesians, Paul explains the gospel and how God in his kindness has invited us, both Jews and Gentiles, into relationship with God through Christ. And he transitions from chapter three to chapter four, which is almost like a different book. And there he starts to talk about unity in the church and unity within the body of Christ. He talks about marriage. He talks about people from different backgrounds and ethnicities getting along and doing life well together because we are now the church. We're the body of Christ. And as he talks about this, he's trying to encourage the Ephesian church. But there's a very familiar passage of scripture that we see at the end of chapter three in Ephesians that I really think hits home with this idea of what's the point? What's the purpose? It's as if Paul has a moment where in the middle of his writings, he's reminded of why we exist as a church and what our purpose is as the body of Christ. And that's what I wanna focus in on today as we read. So look with me at Ephesians 3 and verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees. And what we see at the end of chapter three here is that Paul goes from writing to the Ephesian church to suddenly bursting into almost spontaneous prayer and praise. So when he says, I bow my knees, it's a picture of his prayer for the Ephesian church. And I think for us as well, but let's read on and see what he has to say. Verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he, that God, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Let's stop right there for just a moment. Because here Paul is praying in his writings for the believers there in the Ephesian church, that God would grant them three things. And there's three specific things that Paul prays for when it comes to the Ephesian church. And I wanna note these very briefly. He says, number one, to be strengthened by his spirit in our inner man or our inner person, our inner man, inner woman. Number two, he says that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. And then three, he says that we would comprehend, we would be able to embrace the love of Christ. So I wanna go a little bit deeper. These are Paul's three prayers for the Ephesian church, but I wanna take those prayers and apply them personally for a few minutes this morning before we get to the rest of the passage, okay? Let's look at three applications for these prayers that Paul is praying for the Ephesian church. If you're taking notes, here are the applications, all right? Number one, we have to ask the Lord to strengthen us inwardly by his spirit, especially when our faith starts to become a routine. 
We don't want our faith to become a routine where we're going through the motions and it suddenly becomes dull and it becomes mundane. We need to do what Paul said here. We have to stop and ask the Lord to strengthen us inwardly by his spirit. That's the way that it happens. Now let me just give you a few thoughts about this, if we can, for a few minutes here. First of all, my exterior person, my outward person, will only be as strong as my interior person. I'm going to struggle on the outside if I'm not first strong on the inside. And Paul talks about being strengthened in the inner man, or for all the ladies, on the inner woman. When we spend time with the Lord, it's the Spirit of God that will strengthen us inwardly. If my outer person feels weak, it's because my inner person is suffering. If my outer person feels weak, it's because my inner person is suffering. And if my inner man is failing, my outer man will soon follow. Life will often feel routine and mundane if my inner man is not continually being strengthened. And again, how do we do that? Well, Paul says that we're strengthened in the inner person by the Holy Spirit. So here's a question I want to ask you. How much time and space do you give in your daily life for the Holy Spirit to strengthen you? Just stop and think about it for a minute and ask yourself that question. How much time, how much space do I give the Holy Spirit in my daily life to strengthen me? One of the things that I've learned over time is that if I want God to strengthen me, I have to make space to be in relationship with him and allow him to work. And I want to give you a really practical example of this. We talk about being strengthened in the inner person. My wife and I were having some pretty serious conversations the other day because sometimes you look at your life and you realize that life gets a little bit crazy and out of control sometimes. Things get hectic. We have four kids. We're a homeschool family. Life, especially for her, can get crazy sometimes. And I can go to work and I feel like I'm busy. I can't even know what she's dealing with when she's at home with four kids all day long. And with that said, sometimes we'll have these conversations and I'll be like, are you good? And she's like, yeah, I'm great. Things are good. But then, as everybody knows, sometimes you have these honest conversations and it's like, how's it going? It's like, I'm not doing so good today. Now, I've heard it said that men always want to be fixers. And I kind of rejected that idea for the longest time. Then I got married. Then I had kids. And I found out that every time my wife says to me, things aren't going so well today. The first thing I do is I say, well, what can I do to fix it? How can I make it better? How can I fix this for you? And here's what's interesting about it. Every time I go to my wife wanting to fix something that she's feeling or something that's going on in her life, I always start with the external stuff. How can I help you with the external things? We sat down the other day, and this is what she said to me. She goes, you know, I've been thinking about this, and I realized that one of the best ways that you could help me is not to do anything for me externally, but just to help me have some time in the morning where I can close the door, not have any kids around. I can open my Bible, give me 30 minutes just to sit there to read, to pray, and let God come in and be there first thing at the beginning of my day. And here's the deal. What she's saying is, I need help on the inside. It's not about fixing the outside stuff. See, as human beings, when we see ourselves having challenges or those around us having challenges, we attempt to fix things on the outside, but only God can fix things on the inside. And if we will allow his Holy Spirit to to fix things on the inside, everything on the outside will start to take care of itself. Doesn't mean that life's gonna be perfect. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna experience challenges. But if I wanna be strong on the outside, then I first gotta be strengthened on the inside. Paul says, my prayer for you is that you will be strengthened in the inner person, the inner man, the inner woman. How? By the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you again. How much time, how much space on a daily basis do you give the Holy Spirit, not just to be in relationship with you, but to strengthen you in your innermost person? Earlier this year, we did a series called First Things First. One of the things I've come to understand is that when it comes to my relationship with God and being strengthened by the Holy Spirit, that has to be a first thing in my life because if I don't make it a first thing, I'll leave it to being a last thing and last things never have enough time. If you'll make time for something and allow it to be a first thing in your life, you won't leave it for last and it'll always be a priority. You'll be strengthened in your inner person Therefore, you'll be able to deal externally with the challenges of life. Now, I want to give you this quote, and this is not a spiritual biblical quote. It's just a good thought, okay? The legendary coach, John Wooden, said it this way. He said, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Our walk with God is always going to require preparation. And do you know what our preparation is? It's being in constant communication and relationship with God the Holy Spirit. 
if we will make space, if we will create intentional time to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit, we'll be strong internally, so therefore we'll be able to deal with all the stuff that happens to us externally. Make sense to everybody? So we have to ask the Lord to strengthen us inwardly by his Holy Spirit. If that's gonna happen, we're gonna have to be intentional about it. But the second thing that Paul says that we can, we can apply in his prayer here, number two, we have to feed ourselves the word of God if we want our faith to grow. If we want our faith to grow, we have to feed ourselves the word of God. Now think about this for a minute, this contrasting thought, okay? Eating versus starving. If you want something to grow, you have to feed it. If you want something to die, you need to starve it. It's amazing how often in our life and in our walk with God, we will constantly feed the voices of fear and worry and concern all around us while simultaneously starving our faith at the same time. It's amazing how often we do that, but yet when a challenge comes our way, we're unable to overcome it. Why? Because we've been starving our faith and feeding our fears. If we will feed our faith and starve our fears, what we'll find is not only are we strengthened on the inside, but we can absolutely deal with the challenges that begin to come our way on a daily basis. Now, when we talk about faith, man, we got such a strong faith teaching tradition here in our church. And in Romans 10, many of you will know this, but Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The one way that we grow our faith or feed our faith in our walk with God is by continually being in the word of God. It's the place where spiritual growth happens, where faith is built. But watch this. Paul speaks of us feeding our faith, and he specifically prays that through faith, Christ would dwell in our hearts. Now think about that phrase that he uses. I pray that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith. It's very simple language he uses because it's almost the way that we would describe it to a child at salvation. We invite the Lord to come in and live or dwell in our heart. And we talk about this, and I think it's important to understand that there are always going to be times in our lives where we don't feel like God is close, even though he lives right here inside of us. If we are Christians, we might not always feel the Lord in everything we do, but we can still take comfort in knowing that he's right here. And listen, we don't want to live Christian lives that are dictated to by our feelings. We need to know that God is close, that God is near. But I love the way that Paul writes this because he talks about the Lord dwelling, the love of God dwelling in our heart through faith. One of the things I've come to know is that when I'm in the presence of God and I know that he is near, I walk around a whole lot more confidently in my daily Christian life rather than wondering where he is. And even though I know he's here, there's something about being in the presence of God that reminds me and encourages me that God is with me all the time. And we don't want to live by our feelings, but it's certainly good to be reminded that God is close. Now watch this. If you go back to the very beginning of scripture and you see the story of Adam and Eve, there are things that happen there in that garden setting that are still so applicable to our everyday lives. Because you see that God gives Adam these instructions and he trusts that Adam is going to tell his wife this is what God says. And when they're there in the garden, what do they have? They have the presence of God. Adam and Eve walk with God in the cool of the evening. And they have the promise of God that all of these amazing blessings are around you. There's just this one decision that you don't make. That it's the one thing that you don't do. This one fruit that you don't eat. The blessings far outweighed the option. And he had the, they had the presence of God and they had the promise of God. But suddenly the serpent walks up to Eve and what does he say? Did God really say? And suddenly she begins to listen to the voice of the serpent. And her faith is now being starved and her worries or her fears or more specifically her curiosity is being fed. And now she's starting to question God's promise. And we know of course that she eats of the fruit. And as soon as sin, sin enters the picture, suddenly they feel distanced from God. It's amazing how in our everyday life we can feel so far from God when we're not partaking in his presence and of his promises from his word. If we want God to dwell in our hearts and be near to us, we have to continually make the decision to feed our faith and be partakers of his presence and his promises. And we find all the, pre all the presence of God by being in worship with him and daily communion with him and the promises of God, of course, from his word. So if we understand that, we can feed our faith and the love of God will dwell within us. Now, let's go forward and I'm gonna talk about the third part of Paul's prayer and then we're gonna wrap this, okay? 
Number three, Paul says, we must see the love of God as a blessing to be embraced, not a badge to be earned. The love of God is a blessing to be embraced, not a badge to be earned. Can I tell you this morning, church, there's nothing that you can do to earn the blessing of God and the love of God in your life. There's nothing that you could do. And I love this thought because Paul says, I pray that you would comprehend the width and length and depth and height of the love of God. And when he says that here, it's like a picture of Paul looking at the great dimensions of the love of God. And he's like, as long as I discover how great God's love is, it's like I never reach the end of it. The height, the depth, the length, the width. He looks at the love of God and he says, you have no idea what God has done in my life. And when I think about the vastness of his love, I want you to experience it for yourselves. And when I read this, I wonder if Paul is actually reflecting upon his own testimony. Because you think about Paul's life and everything he went through and how far God brought him. You see, Paul, previously named Saul, had been a Pharisee, a scholar of the Old Testament, a student of the law of God, yet time and time again in his writings refers to himself as the least of the apostles, the chief of all sinners, and he recognizes that he is unworthy of Christ's acceptance. It's as if Paul knew that God had a million reasons to condemn him or reject him, yet found one reason above all else to accept him, and it was because of just how great he loved him. I read this part and it hits home with me. Because I picture Paul reflecting upon his testimony saying, over the course of my life, I've found that there is no end to the love of God. And I want you to experience it too. And when I think about it in those terms, I look back over the course of my life and it, it hits me so strongly that there's a million reasons why God would reject me or condemn me because I've done a lot of things wrong. But there was this one reason why God would receive me that outweighed all those million reasons and it was the simple fact that he loved me so very much. Can I tell you something today, my friend? You might be sitting in the room right now and as we talk about a relationship with God, you might think of a million reasons why God wouldn't receive you, why he might reject you or condemn you, but there's one reason why he would accept you that outweighs all of those things. It's because God loves you so incredibly much. He loves you with everything. He gave Jesus to come back into relationship with you. And when Paul writes this, it's as if he's saying you need to find just how big the love of God is. It's important for us to remind ourselves every day of our lives that the love of God is a blessing to be embraced and not a badge to be earned. And if I get to the place where my walk with God becomes routine or even starts to become dull or mundane, I have to go back and remind myself that God loved me so much he gave his very best in exchange for my very worst. And there's always something to praise God for. Now I wanna go on in the time that we have left and I wanna look at the rest of this passage because the next two verses in this passage of scripture are verses that a lot of us know really, really well. But we have to read them in context in order to understand exactly what it is that Paul is trying to express here. Look with me at verse 20 because Paul now goes from prayer to praise. In his writings, he goes to, from praying for the Ephesian church to suddenly praising God on their behalf. Watch this in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Stop right there. How many of you guys know this verse? Come on, how many of you know this verse? I grew up knowing this verse in church. I've heard it quoted all my life. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, some translations say, or imagine, according to the power that works within us. And I would stop right there. But one of the things you have to understand about verse 20 is that it starts out with these three words that say, now to him. And that word to is a preposition, meaning it's begging for a verb to follow. It's as if you are writing a letter or you are writing an email and you start out that email addressing it to somebody. See, when we say who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, that's talking about the nature of God and his attributes. But when Paul starts out saying now to him, he's addressing God and speaking to God. So let's read it again and put it in context. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above 
all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Verse 21, to him be glory, where? In the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever, amen. And the reason why I wanna read that in context this way is because I think sometimes when we think about church and our faith routines, we can reach a place where we stop and ask the question, wait, why do we do this? And I wanna ask all of you the same question, why do we do this? Why do we gather? 10 days ago, right down here with our staff and our students, I asked that very question. Why do we do this? And I asked everybody, you know, just think about it rhetorically, seriously, why do we do this? And I imagine what some of the answers in this room might be. If I asked everybody, why do we do this? Some of you might be like, I don't know, my husband, my wife brings me, and I just gotta be here. I'm glad you're here. But listen, I'm joking. But here's the deal. Some people might say, well, Zach, we do this so that people will come to Christ. And I believe that's a good thing. I believe it's a really good thing, but is it the reason why we come to church? Some people might say, well, we do this so that more people will come to church. Maybe people move to the area and they're looking for a new home church or something like that. So we do this so that people will come. Well, I think that's a good thing, but is it the reason that we gather? Some people will say, well, you know, we want people to connect with God and connect with other people. Maybe people are out there trying to do their spiritual life alone. They need help. They need encouragement. They need church family. So that's why we do this. Again, that's a good reason, but is it the reason that we gather? It's made very, very clear here in Paul's writings in Ephesians chapter 3 that the reason we gather is quite clearly to give glory to God. Our lives exist for one reason above all else, and it's to give glory to God. Some people will read this passage. Some people will read this passage and get really excited because we read about the nature of God, and we're like, maybe it's so that when we come to church, we'll see signs and wonders and miracles because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Let me just tell you, I'm all for it. I want to see God do miracles in our midst. But the greatest reason we exist and the greatest reason that we gather is to give glory to God. And as I read through this passage of Scripture multiple times over the last few weeks, it really hit home with me this simple thought. It is my job to give glory to God, and it is his job to do the exceedingly abundantly above stuff. I can't make God do the exceedingly abundantly above, but I can absolutely give him glory in everything that I do. I want to see people come to Christ every single Sunday in our services, but I believe that if we as a church will gather with one cause, that's to give God glory, he will, he will pull people to himself and he will save and deliver people. I want to see people come into the house and find friendship, family. I want to see them find the fellowship that God destined them to have in the church of Jesus Christ. But I believe the way it's going to happen is when the church gathers and says, we're going to give God glory, people come and they say, now that's the kind of people I can hang out with. And I want to see people come in and be saved. I want to see people be delivered. And we believe that our God is a healer. I want to see people walk out of this place healed and set free every single Sunday. But it's not my main objective. Our main objective needs to be giving glory to God. Because if we do that, he will heal people. We exist. We live. We were created to give glory to God. In closing this morning, talk about glory for just a moment. This word glory, you know, we sang a song at the end of worship today that says, this is where the glory is. If you look all throughout scripture, we see the word glory meaning kind of different things. It obviously talks about the majesty specifically of God. But in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory is the word kabod, and it means the weight of God. And you think about that picture of the Israelites gathering in the temple and you think about the glory of God. Scripture even talks about the Shekinah glory, like that cloud of glory that came and settled in the room. And it was like there was a weight and a heaviness in their gathering. Why? Because they were giving praise and honor and worship and glory to God. And the glory of the Lord, like a weight settled upon them. But you get to the New Testament, and the Greek word for glory in the New Testament is the word doxa. And it's a whole different picture. The word literally means a view, an opinion, or a judgment. And we take that and we think about glory and we don't fully understand it. But the point is this. When you see this word doxa in the New Testament, 
It's as if there's a God who watches us and he sees our lives and he watches how we make every decision. He watches the decisions that we make day in and day out and how we choose to live our lives. And as he looks down at how we're living, he's glorified when we choose to honor him and glorify him in what we do. In other words, the judgment, the opinion, the view of God is I am glorified by how they live their lives. That word judgment sounds so negative to us, but all throughout the New Testament, it's only ever used in a positive light. I wanna say to you this morning, church, that if you've become, you've gotten to a place in your walk with God where things feel dull or mundane because you've fallen into routine, God wants to refresh your walk with him. But what he wants from us is glory. He wants to be glorified not just in our collective gathering, he wants to be glorified in our individual lives. And if we'll do it, we'll see God bring in his exceedingly, abundantly, above nature, and throw the super down on top of our natural, and suddenly God starts doing amazing things in our midst. I think about the idea of gathering here every single week. I know a lot of us can bring circumstances with us that kind of serve as a lens through which we see church, and we see our gathering. And I wanna remind every single person in the house, the reason we exist, the reason we were created, and the reason that we gather above all else is to give God glory. I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of reasons to praise God and worship God for what he's done in my life. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, I'm so grateful to be a part of a church, a a church family of people who come and get excited to be in your presence, to be in your house, to worship you and honor you. God, I pray that as we've gotten into your word this morning, that we will be reminded of our purpose. We will be reminded of the point, which is to honor you and glorify you in all that we do. God, if we will glorify you, you will come and throw your super down on top of our natural. And you will do great things because you are the God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think or imagine. I pray you would encourage people that came into the house today dragging a little bit, Maybe they're discouraged. Maybe they're wondering when you're gonna come through. I pray that you would meet them where they are and as we choose to live lives that give you glory, that you would come in and do great things in our midst. With heads bowed and eyes closed, just for one more moment, maybe you're here this morning and we talk about a relationship with God, the God of the exceedingly abundantly above all we can do. You don't have a relationship with him. You say, I don't even know how to have that relationship, Zach. Maybe you should sit here and think about it for a moment. It occurs to you that there's a million reasons why God would not accept you and receive you into his family. I want to say it to you one more time this morning. There's one great reason that trumps all of those reasons. And it's the fact that God loves you so much he sent Jesus to come and die for you and for me to pay the penalty that we could not pay on the cross for the sin that we have committed. Scripture said it's the blood of Jesus that makes us whole. Today, maybe you've never made a decision to come into a relationship with God, or maybe you've done it at some point in your life, but you know today, right now, you're not truly walking in a relationship with God. I wanna pray a prayer in just a moment. It's not about magic words. It's about the commitment in your heart. If you wanna come into a relationship with God today, I can't think of a better time to say yes to Jesus than right here with a church family on Sunday morning. I'm gonna pray this prayer right now, and I'm gonna invite every person in the house to put your faith in Christ, whether for the first time or to do it again as we welcome people into God's family this morning. Would you repeat these words after me and say, Jesus, I thank you for going to the cross for me. I believe that you are the son of God. And I believe that your death was full payment for my sin. I believe that God raised you from the dead, giving me new life. So today, I will follow you. I put my faith in you and my trust in you for all of my life and into eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask everybody in the house if you would stand to your feet this morning. We're going to take just a couple of extra moments and we're going to give God glory in his house this morning because this is what we exist to do. We sang those words just a few minutes ago. I said, I'm singing a new song even though the story is the same. I think if we all stopped and took time 
we could all find a new reason every, every day of our lives to give God glory and praise for all that he's done for us. So I'll invite you all in right now for just a couple more moments to worship with us. Let's give God glory together this morning. Cause this is where the glory is You're the one I'm walking with This is where the glory is I'm never alone This is where got something to praise God for, would you just lift your hands? Let's put our hands together, lift our voices, and give Him glory one more time. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we choose today to live our lives in such a way that brings you glory, that you would look down and smile upon the, the choices that we make, the way that we walk, the way that we talk, how we are at work, how we are at home, how we are in our neighborhoods, in our marriages, in all of our relationships, our hobbies, every area of our life. Be praised and glorified. Smile upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One last thing before we go. If you made a decision to follow Christ this morning, we want to help you start your walk with God. It's the end of one journey and the beginning of another. We have a simple book we want to give you. It's just a tool called The Next Seven Days that will help you get started in that walk. And right after service, in just a moment, we'll have prayer teams right down here near the front of the platform. They're not going to embarrass you or anything like that. They just want to help you, pray with you, encourage you. If you made that decision, come see one of our prayer teams. Get the book from them so that we can help you get started in your walk with God. Hey, if you're here today and you need someone just to pray with you and encourage you, that's why our prayer teams are here. So take advantage of that. Let someone pray with you today. And finally, if you want to get the next seven days and you're in a hurry after service, just stop by the next seven days desk. It's right between the glass doors before you exit the building. Can we put our hands together and welcome some people into God's family today? Awesome. Hey, we love you, Bridge family. Have an amazing Sunday and a great week. We'll see you on Mother's Day next Sunday morning.